ever was To catch them is my real test To train them is my cause Number one, if you weren't singing along to that, kill joy. <laughs> I'm 37. I was 17 years old when I first heard that song. And every day after school for an entire year, plunk in front of the TV and watch it. My senior trip, I got up, watched it, and then played paintball. So there is no excuse. This is one of those things that transcends space and time. This is like Harry Potter. It will always be cool. I don't care what age you are, you can still enjoy it. But you know what that means. Hey, Dylan. <laughs> hey, Dylan, do you have another one of those magical cans? I do, but I'll give you one later. I'll give you, okay, cool. Give first. Sure. But when you got something that's timeless and ageless that's going to forever transcend uh, our pop culture and our understanding of the world, you're always going to run into people like me, bored college students. People who really get into things and want to write college papers about them. And I was a freshman in college, going through my major Pokemon phase, playing the trading card game every weekend. So, of course, I tried to find ways to blend it together with a lot of the things I was studying. I was studying folklore studies. I was studying mythology studies. I was giving these long-winded expositions about Pokemon and mythology and the nature of transcendent pop culture. And the general response I got from every single person I talked to was this. Really? Really? You're going to talk to me about mythology and sacred storytelling and epic storytelling about a game with kids who chuck balls at monsters. There is no value in that. Oh, but I beg to differ. When it comes to the media we create, when it comes to the way we consume that media, when we reform that media, the way we share that media, these kinds of stories all have a lot of different traits. And if you're familiar with Joseph Campbell, I am, he is falling out of favor with me because the man was a raging misogynist. But he did create a couple of interesting ways of looking at pop culture. Aside from his four dimensions of myth, he brought up these three points. Product of culture, representation of life, and reflection of experience. When we consume mythology, when we consume storytelling, we're supposed to be able to see ourselves in the stories. They're supposed to resonate because we can put ourselves in there. Everyone I know either wants to be a little English boy who discovers he has magic powers, or a bored farm boy on a desert planet who gets a laser sword and shoves it through his father, <laughs> or they want to be a sexy character from Worlds of Warcraft. But we project ourselves onto these characters because they resonate with us. They're supposed to give us life lessons and ideas that can guide us through where we're going. And they're supposed to act cathartically. They're supposed to impart wisdom to us that we can use later. And when you bring this up, the general response is once again, because we have this popular misunderstanding of these kinds of stories. You say mythology or epic storytelling to anyone, I guess, over the age at this point of 30. And they're going to start hearkening back to sacred stories, major legends. They're going to start talking back to gods and monsters and heroes and the things they heard growing up. At the expense of the stories we tell for ourselves. At the expense of the stories that we can put ourselves in. And thankfully, we also have video games. Which not only allow us to experience the media, they allow us to control the media. Because when people talk about myth, they're forgetting one major aspect of it. Ultimately, mythology is supposed to represent the entire history of you. 
Now, in the modern day, instead of listening to a storyteller sit down and say, you must envision yourself as the great hero, we can become the great hero. In the modern day, if we have things getting us down, we have the ability to work it out through video games, narrative therapy. Instead of these being viewed as stories for children, they allow us to work through our problems, work through our world in a way that is pleasing, but ultimately also a fantasy. It allows us to take control of our stories and do things with them. Likewise, it's supposed to represent a connection to what came before. This is where I start waxing about Japanese society because there's one thing that Japanese society does that is incredibly fascinating, and it's this idea of where you came from. How many people here know their grandparents' names? Hopefully all of you. Great-grandparents? Great great grandparents, great 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 grandparents, anyone's hand still up? Like two people. But when it comes to things like Japanese mythology, you can trace your lineage back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Where you came from, where your family lived, what your family did, and it gives you a sense of grounding and stability. Likewise, you're encouraged to go out into the world, explore your hometown, explore the place where your ancestors lived, and develop a strong connection to it. At the same time, you can engage in epic struggles to try to define who you are inside. And ultimately, it gives you a way of dealing with the dreaded A word, adulting. I, I love how we live in a world where adulting is not only a thing, but it's a bad thing. Because it talks about the notion of heroism. This idea that you can be exceptional, you can be great. We love a good story about an exceptional hero. Someone who's born to grab that sword out of a rock and shove it in like his half-sister. Arthurian mythology is nasty because you're killing your illegitimate kid that you had with your half-sister. What the actual F? But we talk about these exceptional individuals that do exceptional things. When you look at this from a Japanese standpoint, there is no one who is exceptional. There is only you, 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 not you, no, maybe. No, you're, you're snugging a day-to-day -day plushie. But it's the idea that whoever we are can become greater than this. And as we take these stories and we absorb them, especially if you're in hand with playing Persona, you are trying to become exceptional despite the fact that you may not think it. Now, Pokemon, of course, dilutes this. I'm a fond way of joking that in Pokemon, you are either a small child or a teenager in hot pants whose mother gives you $100, kicks you out of the house, and says, come back when you're an adult. <laughs> now, in America, we call that child abuse. In the world of Pokemon, we call that responsible parenting. But at the same time, it is teaching you to grow, it's teaching you to be better, it's teaching you to be at least a little bit responsible. If you blow all your money on Pokeballs and all your Pokemon get knocked out, everyone starts scolding you for not taking care of your Pokemon and then they won't listen to you, blah, blah, blah. That was the first time I played Blue. But you have to learn to be greater than who you are. You can't rely on, your fa you can't rely on the past, you can't have someone else bail you out. It's up to you and your balls. Think about it. Likewise, it talks about bonds and how we create community. Japan, communal society. I would like to think that we can be a communal society here in, here in America, and we often are when someone screws with us. We can screw with each other all we want, but the moment someone else comes up against us, we will ride up, rise up like a tidal wave and kick their ass back across the ocean. But at the same time, it talks about how we need to be together in a community in order to work well. You need your friends. You need people who will test you. You need to have a bond with the things that are important. Once you get that down, it becomes the true power. Instead of it getting by on your own, like we talk about gumption, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, don't ask for help. Why? Why can't you ask for help? You have to ask for help with your friends if you want to succeed in the long run. They force you to do it because the things you're facing, here you've got your evil. Here you've got your beings that are going to try to destroy you. Mythology sweeps this out into epic conflicts with dark, evil, destructive creatures. There is a spoiler on that screen. Some of you probably know which one it is. But when you're talking about mythical evil, the big bad is the one who will flood the world with deception. The big bad is the one that will destroy you by making you want to strangle yourself. The big bad is an evil, impure Pokemon living in the middle of a world where reality makes no sense, and you have to go into that world, chuck a ball at it, catch it, take it out, and use it on someone else. <laughs> Become the evil.
<coughs> but these are mythical evils. Mythology likes to throw mythical evils in your face because they show things that are afraid for society. It's no, it's not a spoiler because Persona 4 came out like 10 years ago. But the end boss in Persona 4 is Izanami. She is the Japanese primordial mother turned dark mother. Izanami was once beautiful, and when she was created, the gods said, okay, you and your husband go out into the world and fill it with your children. Okay, and when God tells you to have sex, that is now your full-time job. So Izanami and Izanagi went out into the world and had a lot of sex and produced a lot of children. And then one day, Izanami gives birth to Kagutsuchi, the fire god, and dies. You would too if you shot flames from your vagina. But because she is divine, she cannot simply fade away. She goes into a place called the Yomi. The Yomi is dark. The Yomi is dank. The Yomi smells bad. My apologies. The Yomi is kind of like northern New Jersey. <laughs> Where you go through a long, dark tunnel and immediately notice the smell. The thing is, you can't leave. So Izanami is trapped here, separated from her husband, separated from her children, separated from the world. So she gets angry. And all she wants is to leave. Then one day, her husband, Izanagi, the dude in the, really, in the white business suit, walks barefoot into hell. He sees his wife behind a curtain of shadows and says, I love you. I miss you. Please look, come out with me. And all she's thinking is, this guy's an idiot. He knows I can't leave. But you know what? When I get out of here, everyone goes to hell. I'm going to destroy every single thing in this world because they all forgot about me. So she says to her husband, wait right here. I'll be back. And she just goes off away. Izanagi gets bored. He produces a small little comb, a little bone comb. Strikes it against the wall of the cave, flickers to life. Finds his wife, shines it in her face. Her eyes are gone, her nose is gone, her lips are gone. She's emaciated, her hair's falling out, and all he can say to her is, damn girl, you let yourself go. <laughs> so she gets enraged. She attacks him. He runs out of the underworld. He drop kicks her into the underworld. Shoves a stone in front of the door, and they get divorced. Her final words to him are, every day I will, I will strangle 1,000 of your precious human children. His response to her, I'll make 1,500 more. Goodbye. Goes and does calisthenics in the Sea of Japan. But she gets angry. And one day her rage becomes so powerful that she breaks a hole in the side of the Yomi, shoves her a bit of her soul through it. She wakes up in a small foggy mountain town in northern Japan where she gets a job as a gas station attendant shaking people's hands and chucking them inside the television. And, oh, look, my husband just came back. Let me screw with him for the next 110 hours. <laughs> but that becomes the central plot. A mythical archetypal evil wants to make us all strangle ourselves with fear and negative emotion just because um, she was denied a booty call. Uh... It's the Yomi, it's corruption, I'll explain it to you later, but that's a picture of her on the cover of my hell book. Um, that's mythical evil. These are evils that threaten our entire society. The idea that our society could be broken down by things like fear, negativity, self-deception, these are real fears. And if you've ever studied Japanese culture, you know that they are terrified of this. Their birth rate is dropping to the point where Japan will not exist in 100 years. And ultimately, that was Izanam, Izanami's threat. But at the same time, you also have personal evil. Because not everything you deal with is a big boss that wants to destroy the world. Sometimes the things you deal with are toxic attitudes that make you want to destroy everything. Your persona in Persona 4 is Izanagi. What's Adachi's persona? Magatsu Izanagi, corrupted Izanagi, who is too, con who is too deceived by his wife that he's willing to let her out. Likewise... Did anyone, here, did anyone here ever use, like, um, the identify on Shido when you're fighting him to see what the name of his uh, persona is? It's Samael, the great deceiver from, uh, from Gnostic lore, a being whose sole purpose is to make you believe the absolute worst about yourself so that you can open yourself up to deception. Everyone in their life will encounter a personal evil, someone who's going to tempt you or try to turn you into something dark, very rarely will we discover a global evil. And we live in a world right now where we have three. 
So let's just take some notes, then go by the White House and flip it off. <laughs> so at the same time, the same characters pop up, and you're supposed to understand where you belong by looking at the characters. It starts with the everyman. It's you, it's you, it's, it's, it's all of us. We are all, in some respects, the everyman. How we choose to live our lives, we go from normal or ordinary to extraordinary. And in Pokemon, it starts right in the beginning. If you want to name your character Surf Bum and have a party of six surfing Pikachus, you can, in fact, do it. I don't know why you'd want to, but you can, in fact, do it. If you're like me and you're morbid, your party is nothing but ghosts. Or, if you're like me when you want to troll people, it's nothing but Mewtwo's. <laughs> but you tell the story you want to tell. It is your legend from beginning to end. And that legend is how you choose to unfold it. And then you get something like this. I love that, I love that pose. But I just want to bring something else here. His name in Persona 4 originally was Yu Narukami. Do you know what that means? You can become God. Oh, Atlas, oh, Atlas. Meanwhile, you've got your holy fools. These are your class clowns. These are the guys that make you laugh. These are the guys that get cunningly into and out of trouble very, very quickly. And all I can think of for this is the most appropriate example. <laughs> to date, the only Pokemon trainers I have ever seen who got their Pokemon to evolve by feeling sorry for them. You have your mentor, the person who teaches you, imparts you wisdom. They're the ones that will give you the tools you need to succeed, survive, and indeed thrive. <laughs> so in Pokemon, you are officially a graduate student. Doing your professor's work for him, and you don't even get credit on the paper. This one's hard. In fact, for the longest time, Pokemon shied away from shades of gray because they presented a world that was very much good and evil, and they made the decision simple. And then one day they came up with the idea of an anti-hero, a guy who is a good guy but has bad methods. Like, if, if Superman is the hero, Batman is the anti-hero. If Cyclops is the Boy Scout, Wolverine's the guy trying to kill him. And that's the main difference between heroes and anti-heroes. And then out of nowhere, I can't hate this guy. His heart's in the right place. He wants to do right by the Pokemon, but he doesn't understand the bond between mass, between trainer and Pokemon. He doesn't understand how important those connections are. He wants to foist upon himself all of this trouble. And in the end, you have to blast him with, an, with a, a mega arc dragon just so he sees sense. But ultimately, it makes sense that he is, in fact, being deceived. You know what? You know what? I could talk about this, but this could be summed up in one word. <laughs> so you got a bicycle, he's got a car. You got Brock and Misty, he's got cheerleaders. You have Tauros from the Safari Zone, he has every Pokemon ever, and they're all evolved to max level. But when you beat him, that is the most satisfying I have ever felt in a game. Because you beat him. That little arrogant, ugh. But this actually leads to another excellent idea of rivalry. So what I love about Persona 4, the, uh, especially the English dub, is both the main character and Adachi are voiced by the same guy. It's Johnny Young Bosch doing both voices. And in the case of Persona, it goes to show you that for as well-adjusted as Narukami is, Adachi is not. For as responsible and friendly as Narukami is, Adachi is not. For all that Narukami can poke fun at himself, dress up like a girl, and hang out with his friends, Adachi is essentially an incel. Think about it. That is the shadow self. That thing about you that you want to deny exists. That thing that scares you, that you don't want to admit, is inside. If you succumb to it, you turn into a dachi. If you discover what it truly is and you fight it, like everyone fought their personas, you can, in fact, move beyond it. And then you've got the big bad. And I showed you some mythical evils. But I'm, uh, I'm staring right now at the greatest godlike villain that I have ever seen in a video game. I'm looking at you. You're holding a Meowth. 
Get up. Get up. Ladies and gentlemen, Giovanni. You know why I like Giovanni? Because, okay, Izanami is a goddess. She is a corrupted, dark, vile goddess. When you fight Yaldabaoth in Persona 5, he is a god of deception and trickery. Giovanni is human. But Giovanni is wealthy. He's powerful. He is a gym leader. He is the guardian of the Pokemon League. He is the most respected man in Kanto. He has god monsters in his basement. And he controls Team Rocket. And he is human. That is the ultimate form of a godlike villain if I've ever seen one. That is an end boss that you feel good defeating. Because whereas you feel bad for Izanami, she's being corrupted by loneliness, where you might feel bad about Yaldabaoth for whatever reason before you shoot him in the face, this man has no redeeming qualities whatsoever. Yeah, but Getsus is just Giovanni Light. He doesn't have Mewtwo. Okay, for the record, Mewtwo is my favorite Pokemon. He will always be my favorite Pokemon. That's why I have six of him. <laughs> because sometimes Mewtwo got a Mewtwo. But at the same time, you see ideas, you see archetypes, and sometimes they just like to blend mythology together. Like, for example, creation stories. I remember when Pokemon's creation story was very simple. First there was Mew, then there was Pokemon, then everything went to hell. <laughs> and then, then Gen 4 came out. And there was Arceus, and he was good. And Arceus beat his wings and created two dragons, Thialga and Palkia, and told them to go out into the world and create Pokemon, and they did. Then one day, negative emotion got to be too strong. They expunged it from themselves, shoved it into another world where reality makes no sense, and there it's Zeus trying to destroy the world. Did I not just tell you that legend like five minutes ago, just it involved flames from a vagina? In Gen 4, they took the Shinto creation story, turned it into Pokemon. And now you can, in fact, catch them all. And the goal in the end is simply to remove the distortion and prevent the world from ending. Likewise, we always love a good cosmic battle, one side punching the other in the face. This is not in Japanese. I love how they're cheering when I said gods punching each other in the face. This is not, in fact, Japanese. This is actually Babylonian. Jenny, you'd, well, you know this story, right? The story between the beasts of the land and the beasts of the sea who punch each other repeatedly until God shows up, picks them up, smacks them, throws them into the underworld, or as we call it, Gen 3. <laughs> Gee, I wonder where we heard about a giant whale creature versus a giant rock monster in their respective cults. Oh, I know. Every time I went to Hebrew school, my friend Mark Davinsky. But the legend is put there for you to see. This is the first time Pokemon looked outside of Japan to create a mythical story. I hate playing this gen, but I love the story in this gen, especially Omega Ruby. I adored what they did with the narrative design and the world-spanning mythology in Gen 3. Just don't ask me to play it. So then this thing happens, and we talk about equal and opposite forces. Remember what I said about them getting a little trippy around Gen 5? I don't know what they were smoking when they worked on this one, but I think they were staring way too long into yin-yang and said, let's make that a story. It has its own creation myth about yin energy, electric and yang energy, fire, spinning around at the top of a tower creating the world until a beast of ice, nothingness, threatens to subsume it and destroy it. And ultimately, you have to show that we must live. But honestly, the one I've been waiting for is this one. So, about 10 years ago, I gave my first ever panel at NecoCon. It was on mythology and anime, and I ended with this particular section. I was studying, like, Plato, Plato's philosophy my first year of college. And he was talking about hubris. He was talking about arrogance. He was talking about mankind corrupting nature and twisting it to his own vile needs. And I thought, huh, that's cool. And that night, I went to the movies to see the first Pokemon movie. <laughs> and I see there's Mew. And Mew is natural, and Mew is good. And then Giovanni, you bastard, gets your hands on it. He harvests its DNA, strips out its compassion, its mercy, and its love. He ramps up its ability to do damage, puts it in a suit of battle armor, puts it in the basement. The Pokemon movie opens with Mewtwo rebelling destroying Giovanni's mansion, flying off to an island where he doesn't understand why he's feeling this hate and decides to destroy the world. All I'm doing while I'm watching this is going, oh my God, this is exactly what we were talking about in class today. <laughs> Seven-year-old kid sitting next to me is crying his eyes out because that movie is dark. 
So I go to class the following week. You know what we were talking about last week? It's the plot to the first Pokemon movie. And I get my first ever professor side eye. <laughs> what? That's a kid's movie. I'm taking my son to see it. No, don't do it. <laughs> Just don't. So class ends. I see him three days later. So uh, what did you think of the Pokemon movie? Oh, yeah, you were totally right. <laughs> about what? About the, the philosophy or not taking your kid? Both. My son wouldn't come out from under his bed for two days. He was afraid Mewtwo was coming to get him. Mewtwo is coming to get him. But I found that in the first Pokemon movie. It is very stripped down. It is very basic, but it warns you against hubris. Now, the end result of this actually comes to a head in Persona 3. Apathy. The single greatest threat we have to our own life isn't a mythical goddess trying to destroy us. It isn't an evil being hell-bent on subjugating us to its will. It's our own ability to no longer care. What I love about Persona 3 is that Persona 3's central theme is everything dies. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to stand and fight? Are you going to live because you have to live? Or are you going to succumb and wait for the end? There are two video games that actually do this as a major plot. Persona 3 is one of them, the other is Final Fantasy 9. And in Final Fantasy 9, the line is, we live because we have to. And if you can't understand that, then maybe you shouldn't live. As I'm playing Persona 3 and watching as an apathy demon descends from heaven and I realize I'm going to have to die to defeat this, I go holding my head high knowing that at least I made a difference. My friends are still here, my family is still here, and I still care. And then you hear about terms like Kadoshi, Japanese people working themselves to death, simply for the greater good of the world they live in. So I got one more little esoteric concept, and this one comes courtesy of me talking to the priest at my Buddhist temple. In Buddhism, there are 108 sins. If you can remove all 108 sins, you become the Buddha. What happens if you commit all 108 sins? Spiritum is 108 spirits that committed evil. It is 108 centimeters tall. It weighs 108 kilograms. In its Pokedex, it is number 108. And when it came out, it had no weaknesses. Ladies and gentlemen, the Buddha's worst nightmare. And you can catch it in a ball. And you can use it on your enemies. So when I mentioned this to, my, to the priest in my temple, he said, I'm not letting you commit 108 sins. But I could be a Pokemon. What is wrong with you? So moving on. Yeah, yeah, some of you remember that from the last time I did this panel. But to be honest, John Cena is the greatest Pokemon because he's loyal, he's honorable, and he only knows four moves. <laughs> he's up to nine, but then he forgot four or five of them. So... I just throw that in there because why not? Because we're moving on from the serious stuff to something a little more fun. One of the hallmarks of games like, uh, like Pokemon and to another extent Persona is this idea of going up there and collecting and catching and grabbing it. And people think, oh, that's kind of fun. Let's go out there and catch them all. But you ever stop to think why this is important? Well, Japanese culture is thoroughly obsessed with this. Who has ever been to Japan? Gashapon machines are in front of every store every train station, and all you do is put money into them. And you get a little plastic ball with something inside. And you will stand there trying to get the one that you want until you realize you could just go to Akihabara and buy it loose for half the price. But Japan likes to catch things. And a lot of this actually goes back centuries. There's a term in Japanese called shushigaku. It means digest knowledge. And the idea behind it is learn about the world by going out there and experiencing the world. Collect the books and read them. Go out there, look for different kinds of creatures and have fun with it. Explore. Discover who you are. This is rooted in the Edo period. In the Edo period, for the first time, Japan is no longer at war with itself. So the samurai needs something to do. 
their kids also need something to do. So they started publishing books, local guides, and little encyclopedias that talked about the world they lived in. And children were encouraged to read, explore, collect until you could collect no more. And this was a way of discovering who you are, where you came from, and little tidbits about the culture that you lived in. You would go to the shrine and hear stories about the kami in the shrine. You get a little charm and you take that charm home with you as a way of remembering where things came from. You would be encouraged to go out into your backyard, go out into your neighborhood, and discover all the little locals and lore. Eventually, you'd be encouraged to go meet up with other people and maybe have a knowledge battle with them. But it was a way of discovering who we are, who they were as a people. When you go out there and collect, you discover discover who you are. One of the things I love so much about Gen 7 in Pokemon is for the first time ever, you are told explicitly to go out and learn the history of your home. You're transplanted to the Alolan Islands and you go out there doing totem challenges because you need to learn about your home. That is a distinctly Japanese way of discovering things about the world around you. And as you go into this world, you encounter all kinds of critters. And the more critters you find, the more versed you are. Like, for example, let's take a look at a few of these. So, um, okay. We have an Ekans. What's Ekans? And what's Radida? What's Zubat? Uh, Lillipop? Good dog. Good boy. Pidgey? Official citizen of the city of New York, the Pigeon. Now, let's see how many of you are paying attention. What's Sandshrew? Now more people are saying pangolin, and that makes me happy. Sandshrew is, in fact, a pangolin. It is an anteater-type creature that lives on Madagascar that has these long, poisonous claws that burrows underground to catch its prey. If you want to catch a Pokemon, go to Madagascar. But you know where this idea really hits stride? The Japanese are thoroughly obsessed with bug fighting. This is the final part of the puzzle. Bug fighting is a big deal. When you talk to uh, Sugimori and Tajiri, when they were working on Pokemon, they literally would talk about being kids and running out into the world, looking for the biggest, angriest beetle they could find, and take it to the bug fights. And when you think, that doesn't sound like, what? How? No, bug fighting arenas exist in every town in Japan. They're gaudy, they're garish, and they're full of kids. And those kids are busy training their beetles to fight. They even have a bug fighting world championship. They have a bug fighting world championship and numerous video games that strip out all the fantastical creatures and simply devolve it down to gotta catch a bunch of bugs and fight with them. When you play Yokai Watch, one of the central tenets of the game is catch a bunch of bugs. Why? Catch a bunch of bugs. I don't know, scare your sister with them. But this is the final piece to the puzzle. You take those exploration and that knowledge, and then you just put it into play with something fun. The original Pokemon gyms were designed to be like bug fighting arenas, where each arena had a different element, and each arena had a different leader, and you could go around your neighborhood beating up all the different leaders and then going to the world championships in hopes of actually defeating the best in the nation. And because it's bugs, apparently we don't consider this animal cruelty. I don't know, forcing something to get inside a small ball where they exist without food, water, or human contact, then are forced to come out only to fight for your own amusement? That's a dark game right there. And then you look to the past for Pokemon. You got your Archaeopteryx, you got your Trilobite, your Triceratops, your T-Rex, your Pachycephalosaurus, and then right there you have a Relicanth. Who here knows what that is? Coelacanth, it's common knowledge now, the living fossil that they thought was extinct until they found where? Off the coast of Madagascar. Seriously, you want to get a Pokemon, go to Madagascar. Gen 5 also gave us fashion trends. <laughs> they got their fashion trends, but to be honest, if you want to talk about Pokemon, this is where most of their ideas come from. They come from Japanese folklore. They come from yokai. The idea that there are little critters out there in the world that embody mystery. And this is the best definition I've ever seen of a yokai. But the best way of describing it is, you see that big monster in the middle of the screen? Anyone want to fancy a guess at what that is? It's a porcupine. There are no porcupines in Japan. Say you were to see this little thing with blades growing out of its back. What is that thing? It's a porcupine. What does it do? Eats, shoots its quills at you. It is a monster. 
And in the beginning, that, oh, water. That is how they differentiated things. If they didn't know what it was, if it was creepy or weird to them, they made it into a yokai. And the dominating things about yokai is they transform, many of them can evolve, and many of them evoke this notion of something known as kawaii. And before I continue, I have to give one thing. That's why I'm glad you're in the room. Because I usually give this at anime cons. <laughs> Owing to the peculiarities of pronunciation in the United States, people will say when looking at someone who is cute that they are kawaii. Because it looks like it says kawaii. No, no. The word you are thinking of is kawaii. Kawaii means cute. Kawaii, kawaii means scary. <laughs> So if you are referring to honey senpai, kawaii. If you are referring to demon Totoro eating your family because he's secretly a death god, kawaii. Regular Totoro, very kawaii, kawaii. <laughs> Pronounce at your own risk because a lot of monster lore is literally built out of this. Now, remember when I was talking about Japanese index culture? Well, monsters flourished in this time period because monsters were cool, monsters were weird, and monsters we knew nothing about. Are you looking at the butt monster? <laughs> You'll see the butt monster again later. But the original idea behind these indexes is the goal of them was to tell you what you were looking at, where to find it, a story about it, and then you would start to understand. These were original ones. Uh, the one on this side is from a book called Collective Illustrations to Illuminate the Unenlightened. It was a book for children. That is a Baku. You see a big picture, some text, and talks about what it is. The one on the next page is for the adult version that is a giant encyclopedic entry. But do you notice this is a lot like a Pokedex? And you were encouraged to go out and discover as much of this world as possible. And these creatures became burned into Japanese folklore. A lot of the monsters, well none of these, except the Kappa, a lot of the monsters that you'll find in Pokemon are born out of these old folk tales. And creativity, long scrolls, was the way of expressing it. Oh, and here's a fun fact, they also had a trading card game. Where, uh, this is a set of Karuta, I have a set of Karuta, where it says what the yokai is, uh, where to find it, what it can do, and then you would have a fight with your friends. That would usually degenerate in someone stealing someone else's cards. But let's just get started with the most obvious one in the room. These exist in every catch them all game. They exist in, uh, they exist in Persona, they exist in Yokai Watch, they exist in Pokemon. In fact, when most people discover Japanese folklore, the first thing they discover is the Kitsune. So Kitsune are little common red foxes, they start growing a number of tails. At two tails, they can communicate telepathically. At three tails, they take human form. At five tails, they actually gain psychic powers. What do you think happens when they get to nine? Yes, Naruto. They set fire to everything while eating ramen. But the idea that they can mimic who you are, breathe fire, and gain psychic ability is something that is, belongs to every single Kitsune legend. Then you have Sukumogami. These are artifact spirits. Artifact spirits, they're when you have a toy that you love and then you lose it. And then one day that toy gets a soul and gets angry and starts tracking you down in hopes of finding you and ultimately killing you. I am not joking, that is Bannett's backstory. And you have to purify these creatures. Yeah, watch out for that plushie. It's a day day plushie, you know it's evil. But you gotta watch out for those kinds of beings. So you have up there a Shikigami. Kartana is a Shikigami. It is an artifact god whose sole purpose is to blow up other evil spirits, but it dies very, very quickly. You've got Dusclops. It's based on a creature called a Yamawara that holds a lantern, guides you up the side of a mountain to a shrine, asks for money. You don't pay it, he leads you off the side of the mountain. You pay him, he leads you back down. There used to be, um, I used to have the ice cream Pokemon up here because, God, what? You begged for that damn ice cream cone and you lost it. These are Kappa. Kappa are awesome. Kappa are short, strong, they smell like a fart. They like two different things, cucumbers and the flesh of young children. They have a little dish on the top of their head that's full of water that allows them to move around when they're outside of the river. If you ever meet one, don't try to fight it. There's two ways of dealing with a kappa. Way number one is you bow at it. It will bow back to you. The water will dribble out of the dish, and you can run away. 
Thing number two is, you pull some change out of your back pocket, throw it up in the air, the cop goes, oh, shiny. And you can run away. I had no idea what a gold duck was until I discovered what a coppa was. That is a hideous freak of nature. And then they made a Mexican one. <laughs> because Japan don't care. These are my favorite yokai of all time. Tengu. I adore Tengu in every way. I am obsessed with these things because they start out their existence as angry bird monsters who don't like you and want to steal your stuff. I was in Japan four years ago, three and a half years ago, and there's a sign that says, beware Tengu, do not take food outside. I saw a guy come out of the commissary holding a meat stick. I hear a shriek. This giant black bird flies off the mountain, dive bombs the guy, scratches his face, grabs his meat stick, flies back up the mountain. That's a Karasu Tengu. I once got almost murdered by a few of them. Ah, another pun. And then they discover Buddhism. They grow a long red nose and get a fan that allows them to call down storms. These guys also like to mess with you because they think they know what's best for you. So as a Karasu Tengu steals your food, he kicks you off the side of a mountain to teach you humility. Now there are a lot of angry female Pokemon Mawile's fun. Mawile's based on something called a futakuchiona, a two-mouthed woman, where the front mouth, it, it, it says sweet things and consistently lies to you. She's marrying you for your money. The back mouth curses and only tells the truth. She's so famous, the futakuchiona is so famous she has her own Pokemon and her own talk show. I don't recommend watching it, it's really weird. Meanwhile, you've got Frostlass with her coy little demeanor living on the side of a mountain. There's a thing called a yukiona prowls the side of a mountain, kisses you, freezes you solid. You have a problem with it, just, just let it go, let it go. It won't hold you back anymore. <laughs> and then we talk about the elephant in the room, Jinx. Um, yes, Jinx is very racist. No, no. Jinx is based on a fashion trend called Ganguro, where girls in Harajuku would paint their faces all kinds of garish colors to make fun of Hollywood starlets. So you take this fashion trend, you overlay it onto a mountain hag with a child, and you have the jinx. I'm just not messing with them, because they scare me. I like Oni. Oni are big. Oni are strong. Some Oni like to punch the sides of mountains to create lightning. Some Oni just like to prowl the sides of mountains to eat you. Sometimes when you die, you'll wake up in the underworld, and there'll be a red Oni and a blue Oni playing John Ken Pawn for your soul. Because all they're going to do is beat you up because you are a wicked boy who deserves it. And then you've got the Sazayoni. The Sazayoni lives underwater. You're a sailor in a boat. You're passing over the water. You hear someone calling out your name. You look over the side of the boat. You see this beautiful woman drowning. She's trying to reach out to grab your hand. You reach down to grab her hand. This hideous claw comes out of the water, grabs you, pulls you underwater, sucks you inside a shell, and devours you. You will never look at Slowbro the same way again. Now... Oni are big, Oni are strong. There are actually Oni that kick your pillow to keep you awake at night. There are actually Oni that throw temper tantrums, but are there any parents in the room? You're going to like this one. This is the Namahage. Normally you encounter them in Yokai Watch when you cross the street against the light, where it yells at you and then tries to hit you. The Namahage have a festival up in Akita Prefecture. It's February 15th, and yes, they're aware of what day that is. There's a house with some young children in it. There is a knock, knock, knock on the door. The door opens. Outside is a red and a blue mask holding a bucket, a mop, and a knife. And they have a very simple question. Are there any annoying, wicked, or troublesome children here that don't do go to school, that don't do their homework, that talk back to their parents? If the parent says no, they produce a bucket full of candy. So it's like Halloween, but the monster brings you the treat. What do you think happens if the parents say yes? They run into the house, shove a six inch long knife in the kid's face, and read him the riot act about being a good child. Consequently, Akita Prefecture has the best behaved children in Japan because of state-sponsored child abuse. 
but I digress. Yeah, they will be back next year, every year, until you're grown. So we have your bird legends, your thunderbirds, you have your phoenixes, you have both your western phoenix and your Chinese phoenix. These are things that we know. And then I was looking at Articuno and I'm saying, what the hell is an ice bird? And then I discovered, reading 1001 Arabian Nights, a creature called a rook. And they live in the mountains, and they fly down from the mountains whenever they feel like it, beat their wings, and coat the ground in ice. And while looking up images of the rook, I found a picture of one that is in the same pose as Articuno. Reaching outside your own myth to grab something weird, I like that. I like that when they do it with dragons. Because I like dragons. Your typical dragon looks like a Charizard. It's full of fire and anger. Then you go to England. England dragons are weird. Some of them are called worms that have no arms and legs. They borrow up from under the ground and try to strangle you. You will always encounter one on the way home from the pub at night, then wake up in a pool of your own, you know. Or you go to Scotland and you have the wyvern with wings and two legs and a stinger on its tail that does the worst possible thing you can ever do to a Scotsman. Eat its sheep. <laughs> they don't care about the Scotsman. They just want the sheep. And then you have gargoyles, these beings made of pure stone that sit on the top of castles threatening things until old Star Trek cast members pull them above the clouds and then they get a TV show on Kids WB that no one freaking remembers. I am a child of the 80s and 90s. But those are western dragons. Eastern dragons, slightly different. There's a legend of something called the Dragon's Gate. It's a 10 foot tall gate in the heavens. At the base of the Dragon's Gate is a pool full of carp. The carp swim to the bottom, swim to the top, flail, 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 try to get over the gate. If they could get over the gate, they turn into a giant dragon that flies through the sky dispensing wisdom, magic, and vengeance. I swear to God when I evolve, I'm gonna kill you all. <laughs> or maybe you're going to Japan where there's a creature called a Ryu. It's a little serpentine dragon that lives in caves under the water. Uh, every time during the full moon, it comes out from the water and waits for the moon goddess to drop pearls from on high. If it catches enough pearls, it evolves into a true dragon and again flies through the sky granting wisdom and, and honesty. And then we've got the multi-headed dragons. There's this being called the Yamata no Orochi. The Yamata no Orochi has nine heads and a bad attitude. And he flooded the world in shadow. So enter the god Sosanoa, who is walking around the world wondering where all this shadow came from. He arrives at a village, cloaked in the fog, and he sees this woman dressed up as a bride being led out into the trees. And he says, where is she going? Oh, she's a wedding gift for the great god Orochi. Orochi protects our village if we give him virgins. Well, I've never heard of this god. I want to go see him. Walks to the village, out of the village, walks to the trees, hears a scream, runs through the trees, stops dead in his tracks at the nine-headed dragon. No, no, no. I am not fighting that thing. But he knows he has to beat it, so what does he do? He goes back to the village, gets 18 jugs of sake, and gets the thing wicked drunk. Or as we at Magfest call it, Friday night. <laughs> he chops up the dragon, finds a god sword in its tail, and the fog recedes, everyone's happy. I love that legend simply because it is one of the few Japanese legends where Amaterasu doesn't show up. Yeah, seriously. Research the land of Izumo. It's amazing. And then we had Salazzle. People were like, fire poison? That's amazing. How do you do fire poison? Well, let's look at this. Eastern mythology. Eating powdered salamander scales will apparently make you fireproof. Western mythology. Eating powdered salamander scales will make you immune to poison. Eating powdered salamander skills will give you no benefits whatsoever, except a burn on your hand and a trip to the ER. But they blended them together into a very interesting Pokemon that never gets enough love. I liked the, yeah, I loved it too. I love the Kami Trio. I love the Kami Trio because they're supposed to represent Raijin, Fujin, and Inari, three of the primal forces of Japanese nature. You got Fujin, who is purple and green and brings the wind. Wonderful job with Tornadus. You have Raijin, who is red and angry and brings the thunder. Okay, your coloration's a bit wrong with uh, Thunderous. I'll let it slide. But where I get is with Landorus. It's supposed to be Inari. Inari is not angry. Inari, in fact, is cute. So I think that's more of an Inari. Anyone here ever walk by a, walk by a temple or a Chinese restaurant and see these guys? <laughs> these
These things are called Shisa or Koma Inu. They are guardian lions or guardian dogs. They guard temples, they guard businesses, they guard important cultural relics, and in America, they guard Chinese restaurants. <laughs> I swear to God, every time I go to P.F. Chang's, I walk past seven of them. And they're very simple. These are not quite gods, but close. They destroy with fire anything that threatens the temple. In China, and at some Buddhist temples, they are lions. At Shinto shrines, they are dogs. One with its mouth closed, one with its mouth open. And if you wake that thing up, run. It is going to burninate you. So then Gen 6 comes out, and I go to the store to buy, uh, to buy my copy of Pokemon X. And the guy at GameStop says, you don't want Pokemon X, you want Pokemon Y. And I said, no, I want a copy of Pokemon X. And he says, but Pokemon Y has better Pokemon. I want a copy of Pokemon X. No, really, trust me, I've played them both. You're going to love Y. I slam my hand down on the counter and say, give me the Princess Mononoke Pokemon. <laughs> but Shishigami, dear spirits, actually have a very important role in Japanese culture. They are one creature that can go between the lands of the living and the lands of the dead. They're able to ferry messages back and forth between both sides. They can heal you or they can take your soul. And they are completely neutral. You go up to, up to places in northern Japan, the deer will dance in front of your house to banish evil spirits. You ain't seen nothing until you've seen five guys in deer costumes banishing evil spirits from a 7-Eleven. <laughs> this is what happens when you don't clean your bathroom. A six-foot-tall creature with a giant tongue will clean it for you. So, uh, if you want to explain to your neighbors about this maid you have that is giant and stinky, go right ahead. Otherwise, I'm going to clean my bathroom. Oh, look, it's Goku as the Pokemon. <laughs> but both Goku and Infernape are based on Sun Wukong, the Monkey King from Chinese folklore, who goes around... Okay, remember what I said about holy fools? The best way to describe this guy is he got a promotion for insulting his boss. <laughs> that is the holiest of holy fools. Then you've got your ghosts. You've got your things like your banshee that fly through the sky screaming to ward off death. You've got your little reapers coming into your house and watching you sleep. You've got your butterflies that herald evil deeds. You've got your will-o'-the-wisps bouncing up and down, leading you into the fog. You have that cute little, little ghost that just wants to be loved. That's why I have seven Mimikyu plushies. I feel so sad and sorry for the, oh my god! It's dressed up like a Vaporeon! You've killed me. You've killed me. And then you've got, remember the Baku I told you about back like to 8, 20 slides ago? The Baku is a very specific yokai. It is invisible. It is made up of the tail of an ox, the hind quarter of a tiger, the front quarter of a lion, the trunk of an elephant, the eyes of a rhinoceros. It is invisible. It creeps into your house at night while you're sleeping, climbs into bed with you, puts its trunk on your forehead, and eats your nightmares. Because every part of it's a good luck charm. Drowsy puts you to sleep and cast Dream Meter. I guess it's the same thing. <laughs> and I got a couple left. So, Exeggutor is a creature called the Jinmenju. It's a tree with human-faced fruit. You go to pick the fruit. You go to bite it. It makes a face at you. You go, ah, and you drop it. The tree laughs at you as you go running away. <laughs> Apparently, they were hunted to, ex uh, to extinction because they taste really good. Uh, we've got down there, we have Celestila is the legend of Kaguya the bamboo cutter's daughter, who comes out of a little reed of bamboo, discovers she is in fact a goddess, and then Studio Ghibli made a movie about it. Meanwhile, Celestila blows you up. We've got, uh, we've got Tyranitar. Any D&D players in the room? That's the Tarasque. That's the French Tarasque that wakes up, eats the countryside, and goes to sleep. Combuskin? Okay. Say you're, uh, you're a villager living in feudal, feudal Japan, and you see one of your neighbors run out of the trees screaming, the basan is coming, the basan is coming. Right on his heels is a 10-foot tall chicken. Runs into your village, sets the whole village on fire. That's a basan, but the fire is spiritual. It eliminates all of the impurities in your village and your underwear, and then goes back into the forest. The last one here that I actually wanted to bring up on this slide is the, um, the whisk ash for something very significant. Whisk ash is uh, ground, it's, it's groundwater, and it's based on a creature called an onamazu. Onamazu is a mythological catfish that lives under the islands of Japan. And according to legend, if you polluted the water or polluted the land, whisk ash would shudder and cause earthquakes and tsunamis. 
Onomazu is also the name of a species of giant catfish that lives along the coast of Japan. And then one day, about, oh God, eight years ago, an entire school of them that had been in this one spawning area for years got up and left. Two weeks later, the tsunami hit Fukushima. Apparently, Onamazu can sense earthquakes underground with more accuracy than seismographs. So now they're watching the Onamazu. And if they ever get up and go somewhere, they know a tsunami is coming, head for the hills. Now you can in fact catch one, but why would you want to? It's keeping Japan safe. And I got one more slide for you. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is from Yokai Watch. <laughs> this is Shirime. His name means eyeball butt. He has no face. You see him, you scream at the lack of a face, he turns around, moons you, the eyeball pops out of his butt, and you immediately quit drinking. <laughs> because that's the only way you'll ever see something that bizarre in the world today. So, there's more than this. In fact, I could go on for hours and hours and hours, but I have to stop because I only have a few minutes left. Um, if you are interested in more and you would like to support my parking charges, I actually put my Pokemon book back in print. $5 gets you a copy of the Pokemon book and you'll make me very freaking happy. But otherwise, my last panel for MAGFest, I may see some of you guys at KatsuCon. I will be at KatsuCon. Maybe I'll see some of you guys at another con down the line. Hopefully you guys were at least entertained by my stupid dad jokes for the last hour. If you would like to get a book, come and grab them. I have a few to offer. And enjoy the rest of this party con. <laughs>